Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 11. Chapter 11 is the chapter on heat exchangers. That is the chapter where so many of the work that we've done comes together. We've already looked at the different types of heat exchangers. We've looked at the overall heat transfer coefficient, the U, and the combination of U multiplied by the area. And today we're going to continue with paragraph 11.3, in the textbook of Sengel and Gajar on the analysis of heat exchanges and then also paragraph 11.4, the LMTD method. Okay. Now in terms of when we look at heat exchanges, you'll see that in general there are at least two methods that can be used to analyze heat exchanges. And these two methods are the most popular methods and are the ones which are being used the most most. The first one is known as the LMTD method, the lock mean temperature difference method, and the second one is known as the epsilon NTU method, or the effectiveness NTU method. Okay. We are not going to address that now, we are going to address that with the next lecture. But in general, for both of these methods, Let's just consolidate some of the most important theory. Okay, and the theory is that if we look at the heat exchanger, there are going to be two streams, uh, in, and the temperatures are going to change. Maybe something like that. Let's call that the temperature scale here, and that, that is X. Okay, so that is how the temperature on the hot side is going to change and on the cold side it is maybe going to do something like that. And although I've drawn the directions like that, it doesn't have to be like that. Okay. That is just a general schematic representation of a heat exchanger. We've got a hot side and a cold side. Normally heat exchangers are well insulated. We want to prevent the heat losses and it is um, equipment that, are normally, that normally runs for very long hours. So normally we've got steady state conditions also. So therefore, in general, we can say that the heat transfer rate on the cold side, okay, on the cold side, on the cold side we just mean the stream with the lowest temperature. So the heat transfer rate would obviously be from the, the stream which is at the higher temperature to the stream which is at the lower temperature. So the heat transfer rate Q from the cold side or to the cold side is equal to the mass flow rate of the cold side, the CP of the cold side multiplied by the outlet temperature, that temperature there minus TC in. So this temperature is Tc out, and that temperature is equal to Tc in. The cold inlet temperature and the cold outlet temperature. And that should, should be the same on the hot side. Q on the hot side is equal to the mass flow rate on the hot side. Cp on the hot side multiplied by, now, Th in minus Th out. So this temperature here is equal to TH in and that is TH out. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's very simple. Okay, now these terms have a specific meaning and the meaning is it is known as the heat capacity ratio. The heat capacity ratio and the heat capacity ratio is written as C for the hot side which is then equal to the mass flow rate of the hot side multiplied by CP of the hot side and on the cold side it is equal to the mass flow rate on the cold side multiplied by CP on the cold side and have, 
And that product represents the amount of heat needed to increase the temperature with one degree Celsius. So that is the heat capacity ratio. Okay. If the ratio is very, very large, then it means I need a lot of heat to increase the temperature one, one degree Celsius. If it is a low value, it means I do not leave, need that much energy to increase the temperature with one degree Celsius. Okay. Now there are two special types of heat exchangers or two special categories. Two special categories of heat exchangers. And those heat exchangers are known as, and we've done it already, as condensers or boilers. Condenser or a boiler. Okay, so on a TS diagram, that is a saturation line then with a condenser we would change a gas to a fluid okay. and during that process there will be heat transferred to the environment or to the other stream in any case with a boiler it is the opposite now it will be from a fluid to a gas. And to change the fluid from, from, from a f the fluid or the, the fluid from a liquid to a gas, we need to put in heat. Okay. Heat has to be added. In this case it is going to be released. Okay. Now for these special cases, two special categories, the heat transfer rate is not equal to M mass flow Cp multiplied by delta T. Okay. Why? Because as you can see the temperature remains constant during the process. Okay, the temperature remains constant. It is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by HFG the change in enthalpy between those two points. Okay, so for this special category that we have, the C, which normally is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp, is infinite. Very, very important. There are going to be problems in the test or in the exam. The heat exchanger is going to be given to you. And then in the description it's going to say evaporation occurs or condensation occurs or something like that. And one or both of these values are not going to be given. And if you do not use C equal to infinite, then you will not be able to do the problem. So it's a very, very important concept that you do understand that Cp, normally as a gas, you can use that type of calculation in that region, you can use it in this region, but not here. Cp doesn't exist here because it is infinite. Okay, so the mass flow rate multiplied by the Cp in the two-phase region is infinite. Okay. Now in general, The heat transfer rate, now without referring to a hot side or a cold side, we would also say is equal to U multiplied by the surface area multiplied by delta T. And this delta T is now very important because it should be a representative, a very representative temperature difference. Now if we look at this, then you might say, well, let's use this. Okay? And in many cases that might be a good assumption, but there are going to be cases where it is not going to be a good assumption. For example, maybe the temperatures does that, we've got condensation and we've got the other stream doing something like that. 
Okay. So then that temperature difference is not a good representation and we've already looked at it. We've said that it is better in those cases to use the LMTD temperature difference. And here we are going on to the same path. Okay, so what temperature difference should be used there? You're going to see it is going to be the LMTD. Okay. And that is what paragraph 11.4 is all about. Paragraph 11.4 is all about the LMTD, the lock mean temperature difference. Okay, and it starts by considering a parallel heat exchanger. Okay. A parallel heat exchanger. Heat exchanger looks like that. And because it is parallel, all the flow directions are in the same direction. Parallel flow heat exchanger, so the flow is going in there, it's going out there, that flow is going in there, and it goes out there. And this graph gives the temperature as a function of x. Now if we look at the parallel heat exchanger, typically the temperature profile does something like that. Okay. That temperature we call TH in on the hot side, so that is TH, and that would be TH out. And the direction is from left to right. Okay. On the cold side, Typically, the temperature distribution is going to look like that. So that is now going to be Tc in, and that is going to be Tc out. And this temperature difference is going to, we can call it delta T1, is equal to Th in minus Tc in. So this temperature difference, TH in minus TC in. And this temperature difference is equal to delta T2. And that is equal to TH out minus TC out. Now, mathematically, very correctly, what is now being done in the textbook is a control volume is considered. Okay, there's the control volume, and you know how things go with a control volume, the approach that is normally being followed. And without showing all the detail, what has been considered is the heat transfer rate to the control volume, which is equal to minus the mass flow rate H multiplied by CPH multiplied by DTH. And we use the minus sign in terms of the directions now. And then on the cold side, it is equal to minus the mass flow rate on the cold side, CP on the cold side multiplied by DTC. We have done the derivation previously of this equation. So we are not going to do it in detail again. Just go and look on in the chapter on internal forced convection. But the result of that is, as you know, that it can be shown that the heat transfer rate is equal to U multiplied by the area multiplied by LMTD. Where This LMTD is equal to, the LMTD is equal to this temperature difference, which is delta T1 minus this temperature difference, which is delta T2 
divided by the lin of delta T1 divided by delta T2. Okay. So this is the correct way of doing it. Okay. Of using the ln TD. Okay. If you would say let's consider the average temperature as a half times delta T1 plus delta T2 okay. then you can actually go and show mathematically that delta Tm will always be smaller than delta T av average okay. which means that if you use delta T average you're going to overestimate the heat transfer rate, isn't it? Okay. And that is why it is so dangerous to use this approach. So, do not do that. Okay, that is not so accurate. In some cases, the error is not so large, but in general, be careful for that. Okay, now this derivation, take note, has been done for parallel flow heat exchanger. You could do the same for counterflow. You can go and do the derivation for counterflow. For counterflow, as you know, it means that the flow on the inside would be in that direction, and in the annulus, it would be in the opposite direction. That is the definition of a counterflow heat exchanger. Okay, and it can be proven. that the delta T, the LMTD, of, take note, this means counterflow, CF, counterflow heat exchanger, is always larger than the delta T, LMTD, of the parallel flow heat exchanger. Now why would this be important? <laughs> the LMTD of a counterflow heat exchanger is always larger than the LMTD of the parallel flow heat exchanger. It would mean that just by changing the configuration of the streams, the counterflow heat exchanger is always going to give a higher heat transfer rate than a parallel flow heat exchanger. Okay. That is what it means. Okay. So in industry, I've never seen a parallel flow heat exchanger. And if that happens, then it is wrongly connected, most probably. <laughs> okay. As you can see, with a parallel flow heat exchanger, the delta T just becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. So this is a very important conclusion that can be made from this derivation. And then the other category of problems is let's suppose we now consider a multipass and cross flow heat exchangers. Cross flow heat exchangers. Remember what this all is all about is, is with this calculation. What temperature distribution should we use? So theoretically you can show for the parallel heat exchanger it should be the LMTD. That, that is the one that gives us the exact answer. For the parallel flow the same, but it can be shown that the LMTD for the counter flow is higher than that of the LMTD of a parallel flow. Now let's suppose we've got a multi-pass or a cross-flow type of heat exchanger. What happens then? Well, unfortunately it is not so simple, but what happens is that we need to jippo things a little bit. Okay. And we jippo it with a correction factor. And we say the LMTD is now equal to the, f the correction factor multiplied by the LMTD 
take note very very importantly of the counter flow heat exchanger correction factor multiplied by the LMTD of counter flow okay, now where do we get the friction factor of this correction factor from if the correction factor well the correction factor is given in graphs and I'm going to show you one just now and usually the this correction factor is a function of P which might be on that scale as a function of R okay, now what is P and R equal to P and R would typically just as an example P would maybe be equal to small t 2 minus small t 1 divided by t 1 minus t 1 something like that and I'm going to show it to you just now and R is might be equal to t 1 minus t 2 divided by t 2 minus t 1 Now those temperatures, the capital T's and the small T's, there will be a sketch given to you. Okay, maybe the sketch looks something like that. Okay. And on the sketch, it's going to show you T1 and T2, for example. Okay. And T1, like that, and T2, like that. So you have to use that you have to align that with the practical situation in terms of the heat exchanger given to you then you calculate the P and the R value and from that you can get the, the correction factor okay. Okay, now just as an example Lloyd if you can go up to the overhead projector there in figure 11.18 in your textbook there are a few examples are given, four of them I think because it is too small, I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit. Okay. Now look at that one, the B graph. It gives the correction factor for what type of heat exchanger? The correction factor for a two shell pass, so there are two shells, and four, a 12, etc any multiple of four two passes you see so schematically if it has been given to you in the exam it is a two shell pass and an eight two pass heat exchanger then this graph would be valid you see and you would use this graph then in terms of what flows through the shell and there you can see there's the shell there is T1 capital T1 is then the inlet temperature of the shell and T2 is the outlet temperature of the shell you see and the tubes inlet temperature is small t1 and the outlet temperature is small t2 okay, based on that you can calculate P which is then given on this axis and there is R which is those lines there so maybe if P is equal to 0.5 and R is equal to 1.5 then we can get the correction factor as 0.85 you see that? okay, simple okay now there is however one very important thing and that is let's suppose in one of those lines we've got a fluid which is being condensed or which boils okay what happens then? Okay, so if you look at that, if one of them condenses or boils, then the temperatures is going to be the same. T1, small t1 is going to be small t2, or capital T1 is going to be capital T2. And then you might have the problem that some of those P's or R's are equal to zero or infinite. And then students look at it and they say, oh, I don't know what to do now. Okay. What is important to know is that if we have boiling or condensation for boiling or condensation F is equal to 1 okay. so F is always equal to 1 if we have boiling or condensation 
on one of the sides. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's the theory. Are you ready to do a problem? Okay. Let's do example 11.5 in your textbook. And in this example, it, what is given to you is a two shell pass and a four tube pass heat exchanger. Okay, just schematically, there are the two shells. Okay. There's the inlet of the first shell, like there, and there's the outlet of the second shell. And we've got four tube passes going through. So it is one, two, three, and four. Okay. And this one, inside the tube we've got water at 80 degrees Celsius. And the exit temperature of the water there is equal to 40 degrees Celsius. This side we've got glycerine and the temperature, inlet temperature is 20 degrees Celsius and here we've got the outlet temperature of the glycerine which is 50 degrees Celsius. It is also given that the tube diameters are 20 millimeters and that the tubes are thin. Okay, thin tubes and the heat transfer coefficient in the shell is equal to 25 watts per square meter degree Celsius and the heat transfer coefficient inside the tubes is 160 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Okay. And they ask us to determine the heat transfer rate, firstly without any fouling and then secondly the heat transfer rate if the fouling on the outside of the tubes is equal to uh, 0.0006 square meters, square meters Kelvin per watt. We are going to need the surface area of the of the tube, so let's just calculate it to make things easier. It is pi multiplied by the diameter multiplied by the length. And sorry, I forgot to give you the length. The length is 60 meters. Okay, total length of the tubes, 60 meters. Okay, so the surface area is equal to pi multiplied by the diameter, which is 20 moles, multiplied by 60, and that gives us a surface area of 3.77 square meters. Okay, now so from the theory we have seen well, it has been shown to us that we can calculate the heat transfer rate as U multiplied by the area multiplied by LMTD. Oh, sorry. U multiplied by the area multiplied by the correction factor multiplied by LMTD of a counter flow heat exchanger. Okay. 
Now what we also know is that the heat transfer rate on the cold side is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp multiplied by the delta T and on the hot side it is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp delta T. And we could have used one of these equations also to get the heat transfer rate but the mass flow rates are not given to us. So that is the reason why we can't use these two equations. Otherwise we could have calculated it directly from there. Okay, now take note, we have to get the delta T, the LMTD of a counterflow heat exchanger. Now I want you to, to try for me and see. Please calculate that quickly for me. Don't have to do the final calculation, but write down all the terms for me in terms of how you would calculate the LMTD of that heat exchanger. Counterflow. We do it as follows. You don't need to do it physically. The temperature as a function of X. There must be a hot stream and a cold stream. So the hot stream obviously must be on top. Okay, and the hot stream always does something like that, isn't it? Okay. Now I choose for no specific reason normally that as the inner temperature. The hot side, which is 80. Okay, the hot side, there it is, 80. And then the outlet temperature there is equal to 40. Do you agree? Okay. And then there must be a cold side. Okay. Now if that is the inlet temperature, 80 and 40, in the counterflow direction, in the counterflow direction, then on the cold side, what is the inlet temperature? The inlet temperature on the cold side is equal to 20 and the outlet temperature on the cold side is equal to 50. Okay, now you've got a counterflow heat exchanger. You forced it or made it to be a counterflow heat exchanger. Does that make sense? Are you happy with that? Okay. So, therefore we can now say LMTD is equal to this temperature difference which is equal to 30 so that temperature difference is 30 and that temperature difference is 20. Okay. So it is 30 minus 20 divided by the lin of 30 divided by 20. Which is then equal to 24.7 degrees Celsius. Now we need to get the correction factor F. The correction factor F, there is the two shell pass and the four two passes as we have. Okay. So based on that graph, which is then figure 11.18b, P is equal to T2 minus T1 divided by T1 minus T1. Okay, so if we look at that, then the shell is T1. Okay. The shell in the temperature is equal to T1. So that is equal to T1 and that is equal to T2. Do you agree? And in terms of the tubes, what is going in is that temperature T1 there and that is equal to T2 there. You happy with that? Okay. So P is equal to 40 minus 80 divided by 20. Capital T1. 
20 mm, minus 80. And that is equal to 0 0.67. And R is equal to T1 minus T2 divided by small t2 minus small t1, which is then equal to 20 minus 50 divided by 40 minus 80, which is equal to 0 0.75. So based on that, the friction factor is, uh, the correction factor is equal to 0.91. Okay. Okay, now we've got the LMTD, we've got the correction factor, now we need to get U multiplied by the area. We actually already have the surface area, so we actually only need to get the overall heat transfer coefficient. We can calculate it separately or we can calculate it as u multiplied by the area whichever we want to do okay. now remember one divided by ua is equal to one divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside plus the fouling on the inside multiplied by the area plus the resistance of the tube 2 pi KL plus the fouling on the outside plus the flow resistance on the outside. That is the overall heat transfer coefficient correlation. We've done that with a previous lecture. Okay. The fouling at this stage, for part A, it is without any fouling. The second part of the problem is with the fouling. Okay. So firstly, we can delete those two terms. It has been given that it is a 20 millimeter tube, but it is very, very thin. Okay. If it is thin, then it means that di that diameter and that diameter is approximately the same. The limb of one is equal to zero. Okay. So therefore, that term is also negligible. Okay, and because it is thin, that area and that area and that area is the same. Okay, so in this specific case, we can say 1 divided by U is equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside divided by 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside, plus 1 divided by the transfer coefficient on the outside. Okay, which is equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside, which is equal to 100, uh, 160, plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside, which is 25. So the overall heat transfer coefficient is going to be very close to the smallest heat transfer coefficient, which is 25, and if we calculate it, it is going to be 21.6 watts per square meter Kelvin. Right, so now we can calculate the heat transfer rate. We can say the heat transfer rate is equal to U multiplied by the area, multiplied by the correction factor, multiplied by LMTD, for a counterflow heat exchanger. U is equal to 21.7. The surface area we've calculated as 3.77. The correction factor is 0.91. And the LMTD is equal to 24.7. And that would give us a heat transfer rate of 1,830 watts. Or 1.83 kilowatts.
You happy with that? Okay. Let's do part B. Part B is now with fouling of 0 0.0006. So we need to recalculate the overall heat transfer coefficient. So 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient is equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area. Fouling on the inside plus the limb of the diameter ratios divided by 2 pi kL plus the resistance on the outside plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside. Okay, again, the tube is very thin, so we can say that the resistance through the tube is negligible. They didn't give us any fouling information on the inside. Okay. For this special case, where the area on the inside is equal to the area on the outside, we can cancel all the areas. And the result is 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient is equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside plus the fouling resistance on the outside plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside. The heat transfer coefficient on the inside equal to 160. The fouling resistance is equal to 0 0.0006 plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside which is equal to 25. And the result is if we calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient now it is going to be 21.3 watts per square meter. Kelvin. Should it be lower than the other one? Obviously yes, because of the fouling. Should decrease its efficiency. We can see it is, but it's not much. Not much. So if you go and recalculate the overall heat transfer rate, which is equal to UA multiplied by F multiplied by LMTD, U, which is now equal to 21.3, multiplied by the surface area, which is 3.77, multiplied by the correction factor, 0.91, multiplied by the LMTD, 24.7, and the result is a heat transfer rate of 1,805 watts. So if we could compare this heat transfer rate to that one, we can see that there is a decrease, but at this stage it's not a lot. Okay. After 10 years, it might be very significant. Okay, any questions, ladies and gentlemen? If not, thank you very much. <laughs>